lots of social workers in the room too. So if we don't go over um, you know, a lot of your expectations here today, at the very last slide we'll have our contact information. You can grab us for as long as we can stay here and ask questions. Um, if Melanie or Kathy are around too, you can look for them as well. But we already, you know, just in the introduction, you hear how hard yes. this is. And it's so great that you're coming along. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, grandparents, it's really <coughs> finding that, how can we make that support system? And it's really going to be individualized for, for each family member. Yeah, and I also, I think it would be worthwhile, especially for the folks in the room who are sort of new to autism, to just go over the core features of autism if you don't, if you don't know them already. Um, <coughs> And, and also, I like some of you put the kid, the child before autism, keeping in mind that every kid with autism is different. Mm -hmm. Every kid, so it's important that the kid comes before their autism. Right. Um, but there's three core features that, that make up the medical label. So there's a communication uh, challenges, um, there's a social challenge, and then there's often repetitive or uh, uh, repetitive behaviors or restricted interests. Mm -hmm. Along with that, there's almost like a, a fourth core feature um, sensory sensitivities or sensory um, dysregulation. Um, and you may see some of those things or all of those things in the kid in your life or the, or the child you work with. Um, but those are generally the core, the core features um, that make up autism. Oh, before we get started, we wanted to play a video from Autism Speaks. They have a really neat video glossary that I'll get into later. Um, for, for those of you um, who are interested, it, they, they go through the core features of the Minimize this. They go through each core feature, so social interaction, communication, repetitive behaviors, restricted interest, regulatory and sensory systems. They, they show, what's neat about this is they show typical development and ASD development side by side, so it gives you a, a clear picture of some of the nuanced things that maybe the professionals in your life are picking up on. I also find it helpful in showing family or friends that maybe are having a tough time getting their hands around the diagnosis so that they can see some of the really subtle things you might notice, or the professionals in your, in your life might notice. Um, I could talk about this for days. I would, I would play around on it, and I'll show you how to find it uh, later. AutismSpeaks.org, uh, it's, it's the big national support organization. And, and we have uh, on the back, I hope you all picked up, a list of resources, and Autism Speaks is, is going to be on that list. Okay, so I'm going to play this clip. We tell parents that their child has this disorder, it's absolutely devastating to them. Their anticipation of who that child was going to be is lost. It's totally different. And now they're faced with the fact that they don't know what to anticipate. And we often don't either. The parents feel lost. And once, once they get the diagnosis, you just get that feeling like everyone is out there, but they're not fighting for those answers like you are. Making the phone calls, finding out where, you know, where we get the best help, um, what are the best situations for that? Where can we go from here? Where, you know, what stones to, to turn over? Right, and so like Chuck mentioned, that's the really frustrating thing about autism. And the scary thing is that you get a diagnosis and no doctor or no professional is going to say, if, if you do A, B, and C, it will get better. Right? You go to different places and you find out different information. Really, you, the parent, are the driving force behind your kid's plan of care. And that's going to be a, a lot of what we're talking about today is how you can organize and take care of yourself um, so that you can execute you know, whatever, whatever plan it is you have in mind. So today, our objectives are, um, you know, like Chuck mentioned, I'm not going to give you specific strategies to address specific things, but we're going we're to talk about strategies for balancing your personal, family, and professional responsibilities in the context of your, of your kid's plan of care. Um, you're going to get some information on how to adapt to your kid's special needs and what that may look like, or the people that you work with, what that may look like for them. Um, we're going to talk about information and resources available to support you um, in meeting your child's needs. Um, as social workers, we really, I think, well, our education tells us this, and personally, I think we believe it. We honor that sometimes that there's barriers preventing you and, and families from accessing the care that they need, you know, child care, speech therapy, you know, for all sorts of reasons, financial, or, you know, logistical reasons. Um, hopefully today you'll pick up some tips, at least on some people you can talk to to help get over those barriers, because ultimately that's still, still the goal. Um, tips. 
you guys have a lot of tips too. I mean, there's parents here, there's parents of, of almost 16 year old, right? And there might be um, individuals with younger, uh, the Head Start staff over here, you guys have some young ones. So again, sharing amongst ourselves what, what you've learned with you know a teenager, what you've learned raising three kids who have autism can um, you know can help and, and again it's it's an honor to work with with the families we work with and, and caregivers. It's a daunting journey that you guys go on, um, and we learn the most from you guys more than you can probably learn in the in the classes that you just finished taking. I know more than I learned certainly. It's really sitting with the caregivers and the parents. Um, where we stand, we'll go through this quickly. I mean, we all know the statistics, one in 88. I'm not gonna bore you with all that. Um, intervention is, is vital. Early intervention is the key. We, there's a lot of unknowns with this diagnosis. One <laughs> known factor is early intervention can help produce a better outcome. Um, as Ellie has mentioned, your participation is valuable, both in terms of the caregiver and those helping the family. The caregiver is going to be the the one that's going to set the pace for the um, for the <coughs> interventions. And um, autism impacts the entire family, and I'm sure we can talk to a lot of other people here, and you guys again share with us. But it's not just impacting that parent-child relationship; it impacts. If there's other caregivers, if you have a partner, it impacts that relationship. It impacts your relationships with your extended family members. Some positive, you might get closer, some negative. impacts your relationships with your family and friends. Um, and it impacts if you have siblings who don't have autism. Having and raising a child with autism, certainly the demands placed on my caregiver are huge. And so that's going to impact the relationship with a child that does not have autism. And so keeping that in mind, and I guess, you know, just feedback, um, both in terms of, of watching that clip of the gentleman talking about the impact on the family, um, and seeing, I think it was Doug Flutie and his wife, and, and what they went through. Does anybody have any feedback just on the, on the clip, and hearing about the diagnosis, and the impact on you personally, or you as a family? You know, I'd like to say something. Bradley was nine years old, and he was diagnosed with autism uh, probably around the age of four or so. And I got on the autism waiver list, if you may want to explain to people what that is. But I called this morning. I am number 1,085. And the gentleman said to me, right now they are servicing anyone who's been on the list from 2005 and before. So Bradley is nine. He says it'll probably be another three or four years before Bradley's number comes up. But I say that only to say, get on the list now. Yeah. Right. Who's the list? Yeah, at the, at the end we'll have some time. The autism waiver is, is an insurance supplement program. Um, there is a really long waiting list. The intake is really simple, and I can show you how to, it's, it's, a, it's an 800 number. You call with the kids' social security, and then when they come up on the list, they'll do a, a screening and intake. That's and like you mentioned, I think it's important to get every kid on the list, even if they might not need the services, that decision will be made later by the folks who administer the waiver. Um, right? It, it doesn't, I mean, it's, a, it's a phone call. Right. And the more people that access the services, and talk to their community leaders about what's working and what's not working, the better. That's why I think things like this are really important because I can tell you, oh, each county has a family navigator that's gonna help you locate you know, resources in your area. Well, if the family navigator in your area is not working, they should know that, and the people who fund them should know that so that it can improve. So we really have to start using the services that are out there um, with the idea that that will improve. You know what was most amazing though? I asked how many are on that list, 9,000 plus. Right. Now surely there are many, many more that should be. Right. Absolutely. And thanks for bringing that up. It's, it's just another um, thing to realize the impact this has on caregivers. You know, great there's an autism waiver, wonderful. I'm going to sign up, but it's going to be seven, eight years before 
get on the list, or I get services from that list. And early intervention is critical, but we're being kind of denied that. Right. Medicine. Right. It's it's out there, but you're you're going to go on wait list after wait list after wait list after wait list. And I I also keep in mind, you know. There's hope. You can you can rig a system. That's in the beginning. You guys are the driving force. You can rig a system that looks like the autism waiver, or that looks like a, you know the infants and toddlers early intervention plan, right? It, the, the key is knowing who to talk to and when to talk to them. And I you know I can we'll, we'll show you some organizations that can help guide you in that process. I'm just curious. Is there anybody here now who's getting the autism waiver? <coughs> I, this could easy, we could we could talk about resources. All day. I want you guys to know too that social workers here can often have those types of conversations. So you're, if you're interested in having a, a follow-up appointment after this, I'd encourage you to, to schedule an appointment with, with a social worker here. Um, but let me bear with me one second, and I'll show you as if I'm. I'm going to show you as if I was on my home computer. So you go to Trusty Google. Type in Maryland Autism Maker. Okay, and I, there's di there's different there's all sorts of different um, links that come up. I like the Pathfinders one. I think Pathfinders is an easy site to navigate in general. There's an article about it, um, and I'm just bear with me. I'm going to scroll down. And when we say services, it's these types of services. Kathy, Kathy mentioned respite care. You see that 866 number? I'm gonna highlight it. You just call that number um, with your child's social security number. And get them. Curious, has anybody here accessed list funding before or heard of list funding? It's not available for the fiscal year of 2013. Until we'll July, but yeah, I'm curious. So, it's, you know, it's stuff like this that social workers here can talk about, and I'll show you at the end of today's presentation. You guys got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> All right, so our next slide, why are we talking about grief? Uh, I think grief is a part of the, the autism conversation. Um, as Chuck mentioned, you know, we're, we, a, a lot of what we do is sit with families after they receive a diagnosis or at really key transition points in their life, and grief comes up, and grief causes stress, and stress has an impact on your child's quality of life and, and your family's quality of life, your overall wellness. Um, one thing when I, when I talk about grief and when I think about grief I remind myself that it doesn't happen sequentially like you don't go through the stages of grief in order like Monday I'm going to deny <coughs> my kid autism then I'm going to be angry about it on Tuesday and then Wednesday we're going to start bargaining and then I'm going to reach this place of acceptance and I'm going to be okay with it forever it doesn't happen right it comes up at different points if, if, if you're in a relationship it happens at different points with your partner or other family members or siblings it's natural, and one one of the biggest things I hope you take away from today is that it's okay to feel these feelings. It's good. The key becomes is de developing a, a healthy coping mechanism around those feelings as they come up. And just by doing that, just by taking care of yourself when these feelings come up, you'll improve your child's quality of life. I think so often we get really focused, you know, on what therapies we're providing the kid just thinking that's going to improve their quality of life, which is ultimately the goal, right? I mean, we want to get really hard skills, language skills, behavioral skills, social skills, but we want those things to improve their quality of life. Knowing these things about yourself and what triggers them and how you take care of them um, will, will improve, I think, eventually, you know, your, your, your child or your family's quality of life. Um, as Ellie just mentioned, too, it's, it's, it's cyclical. You're going to go through different stages and then you're going to be out on the playground one day and you're going to see little Johnny or Susie um, and you're going to compare them to other kids out on the playground who are typically developing and boom, you're going to go right back into anger or into a sad place. You go into middle school, I mean it comes and it goes and it'll come back through, through your lifespan. So, you know, knowing that and understanding that and being okay with that, if you can be okay with that, and then again, building that support around the parents and around yourselves to help you deal through this is going to be important. And we put down here, it's not necessarily a stage of grief, but it impacts 
impacts the grief is the presence of guilt. Because there's so much unknown with autism, more unknown than known, it is off, it, it, it happens just automatically with our brains when we don't know something, we try to fill it in. We try to fill in the answers. So in that, you're gonna have, what did I do? Did I somehow cause this? What didn't I do? I should have listened to myself earlier. So guilt plays a huge part in this, and it kind of wraps back around to sadness and depression, because guilt and depression and sadness are so closely linked. So just understanding that and being able to talk about that and to get those feelings out there, there's no one-to-one -one connection between anything anybody does in autism. We know that. We can't say you do this, you're going to have a child with autism. But parents are still going to have guilt. And I just uh, that, uh, something to think about for the professionals in the room, and I find it hard sometimes, myself personally, is really letting families openly explore the things that they think about. So creating a space where they can explore those things. If they think that eating bananas when they were six months pregnant, you know, might have caused their child autism, let let them explore that. And then you can talk about science behind different things. You can guide them to different resources. But that envi that environment that you create has to be safe and open. You don't automatically want to say, hey, no, you're, you're, nothing you did, nothing you did. You want to create a space where they can explore those things because they come up. Um, so. um, present, even present in the room, you know, you have individual effects and family effects after hearing about the diagnosis and raising a child um, with autism. Stress level, and we're going to get more into that um, in a few more slides. Um, mood changes, shifting in goals, you know, once you hear um, and learn about the diagnosis, boom, everything that you thought and you had planned in your head um, with this child is just changed. You're going to go this way and all of a sudden you're just taking a hard left hand turn. And it can shift certainly your immediate family and all of the different kinds of therapies and services and logistical details about your life. It can shift where you were thinking about moving to, where you're going to make um, a career change and get that big important job. I mean, it changes everything. And realizing that and helping parents process that is important. It changes, and it, it, individual and family effects, it changes how we communicate with one another. So parental stress uh, happens, and it happens more in some ways for parents raising kids with autism than parents raising kid, typically developing children and children with other special needs. And there's some reasons for that, right? The uncertainty about the cause that we talked about is stressful. It's stressful. Um, and that, in turn, can, can s sort of shape what types of interventions you seek out for your kids. And that can be stressful, too, because sometimes those interventions aren't covered by insurance and may not be based in science, so that adds you know, additional stress. There are social challenges associated with raising a kid on the autism spectrum. Sometimes parents don't get that same feedback um, about their parenting um, than they would from a, a child who has uh, typically developing social skills. Um, and also the behavioral challenges associated with autism are super stressful. Right? A lot of kids on the autism spectrum elope. You know, it's a fancy word for run off when they're little. Uh, I, th I think that lasts even when it goes away, right? And you have to modify your house, you're constantly on guard, and that, that can be really stressful. People may question your parenting because outwardly your child looks as if they're developing typically. Because if, if that was my kid, they'd stick right next to me, you know, no problem. And they don't know what's going on developmentally um, with your child. And that may happen throughout the lifespan for a, a variety of, of, of reasons. And that stress can be physically damaging to you, <coughs> Um, and, and, and stress, if left unchecked, um, can, can lead to anxiety and depression. One thing I want to keep in mind, I think now is a good time to share it, I'm going to share it later. What we're talking about is not stress elimination, right? That's, it's absolutely impossible. Stress can be a good thing. We're, we're talking about stress management. Right? So developing some strategies just to manage stress, because stress can be activated, it can be good, a good thing, a helpful thing. Um, but if left unchecked, is when it becomes Oh, right. A quote that always comes into mind. I'm not sure where we just I, added this in, so it's not I, I, picked, I picked this up. Do um, uh, you guys want me to read it out loud? No. I can read it. I'll read it out loud. Um, so I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element. It is my personal approach that creates the climate. 
It's my daily mood that makes the weather. I possess tremendous power to make life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis is escalated or de-escalated. And the person is humanized or dehumanized. If we treat people as they are, we make them worse. If we treat people as they ought to be, we help them become what they are capable of becoming. Uh, this guy was a, a teacher and a, a, a therapist. And that just reminds me, we get so caught up in doing a therapy, and we often forget that us, ourselves, we, we can be therapeutic, right? Like if our child has problems with frustration tolerance, if we learn to, to manage our frustration, particularly when they're frustrated, it, it will get better. Easy to say, easy to say, but it's important. And hopefully that's one of the big takeaways from today. Yeah? I just had to say something. I notice when I do get stressed out, I think my son senses that, and then he gets stressed out. Mm -hmm. So it's like I have to take a minute, you know, just retreat and just relax and just get in a happy mood. Because <laughs> I notice that he'll like, notice that I'm upset, then he'll actually copy me. So just want to say something. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah but what do you do? Uh, what do you do to, to kind of de-stress and get to that happy place? Oh, I have to go to the gym. Uh -huh. <laughs> I do yoga, I run, so that helps me relax. Or I just drink tea. <laughs> You know, just take some time and just relax a little bit. Usually, I have my husband to watch him while I go out and, you know, have me time. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that can be um, a lot harder not to be not to stereotype dads, um, but I know as a, as a guy when you when you have these kids who start to escalate, it's hard for dads um, not to join in with them. Mm -hmm. All right, because we. I don't know. There's something in us that we want to we want to go, right? And you you can't typically developing child or a child with autism you can't out escalate a kid. I mean they're gonna win. So it's it's taking advice from you and when they start to go there, recognizing in yourself, you know you feel that jaw start to clench or you feel that fist start to get up and you want to go with you want to go there, but going out to a different you know to a different place. Um, I, I, I just named two, so I was just talking about you know yeah. symptoms. So you notice you, our bodies tell uh, tell us um, what's going on with, with ourselves, right? When we're tired, our eyes will get heavy and we'll start to nod off. You know, boom, my body's saying I'm tired. When um, we're happy, we're laughing, right? Your body tells you you're, you're in a pretty good. Well, there's lots of warning signs, warning signs that come with having stress. Everything from cognitive, <coughs> emotional, physical, behavioral. You know them, you have them, your cells, you feel it in the back of your neck or your shoulders, your jaw will clench, your fists will, will, will clench up, tighten up too, you'll be short with people. Um, we, listen to, we listen to our kids, we listen to everything else, but oftentimes we forget to listen to ourselves. So again, another takeaway is listen to what your body is telling you. There are signs and symptoms right here in this room of stress and we're going to put those on the back burner to make sure that we provide our children with everything that they need for that next appointment, that next intervention, and we kind of push that warning sign down. We're not going to listen to it. I get I mean, everybody here, we want to put our kids first. That's, that's part of parenting. Um, but you've got to find time to set aside for yourself and listen to what your body what it's telling you. Chuck, can you talk a little bit about how it may affect a parent with autism? Because the, in our situation, the parent of the child has autism as well. Mm -hmm. So, like, how will her, how will, would her, mm -hmm. would her stress pretty much, you know, look the same? <clears throat> and that's going to be difficult to answer. I mean, we've heard the saying, many of us have, you know, you know one child with autism, you know just that one child with autism. Um, I'm sure if you know one parent who has autism, that's going to be the parent. I think that a lot of the um, the self-regulation issues that might come along with somebody who's on the spectrum, just that inability to um, um, to really verbalize how they're thinking yeah. and feeling, um, will be harder for that parent, and especially for that parent to model a lot of that for the child. 
Um, that can be very hard, just a lot of the facial cues, um, the nonverbal socialization that we do, you know, that we do all the time. Um, that's one of the um, you know core features, just that socialization piece that Ellie was talking about earlier. Um, it's going to make it harder for that parent to, to model some of those behaviors and strategies for the child. Do you have yeah. I mean, one, one, one thing that I think about when I work with families and talk to professionals, I think it applies to, is just developing some system for checking, right? So like either internally in your family or like some system where you can check in with that person uh, in a way that works for them. So like if they have trouble identifying how they're feeling with a verbal question, you could think there's visual ways to to map that out. Um, just developing some, some sort of check-in. And for families, just the space to check in if it's like a car ride or a time at breakfast or dinner. Um, and it doesn't have to be super sappy, like, you know, you look really, you know, you look really stressed out today. I, you know, just a, a time to have the, have, the, have the conversation and check in in a way that works for that person. And, and the use of, you, know, you mentioned the word visual, the use of visual aids. Um, a lot of these uh, kids on the spectrum are very visual-based learners. And I imagine that might um, relate to the, to the parent as well. So using kind of that visual check-in, using a chart, some kind of um, graphic that can help parents and kids check in with, with their mood, their stress level. It's just making up a story about where you want to go. So today, if you're going to go to CARD, so you can take a picture of the car. We're going to go to the car today. You can take a picture of the road that's going to be, these kids know these roads like the back of their hands. They'll know if you're going, oh, that's not the way. So you take a picture of the road. You take a picture of the outside of the building. You take a picture of the inside of the building if you have that luxury. If not, you can go to Google Clip Art and you can get pictures of buildings and roads and you make a story. And it's really just kind of cut and paste and Printing it on a copy, or it doesn't have to be fancy. You could definitely mention it to if your children are in school, mention it to their teacher mm -hmm. or their OT. They'll right. give you pages and pages of those thumbnails because those clip arts are very expensive if you don't have already access to them. Bye. My teach, my son's teacher just prints me out like books, and I have a social story for if the wind changes, just so we're prepared. You know, because when he has an outburst, it's it's an outburst. It's with all of his little body, and it's it's something. <laughs> social story. Thank you for bringing that up. It's, yeah, just visual base really can help them in advance of doing something, going somewhere, so they have time to process and get ready for it. Also, if you Google it, there's a lot of running name stories Resources. Um, one of the resources is um, what's called the Autism Internet Modules, and you can learn. Um, I mean, basically, it's like an online course where you can learn anything and everything about autism and kind of different interventions. One is how to write a social story, so they'll walk you through that too in a video clip about how to write a, write a social story. And do we have do to learn? Yeah, I can pull all that stuff up too. And also, if if, uh, if the kid or, or the adult in your life is verbal or really bright, high function. Sometimes it's just the conversation ahead of time. Part of what, um, I'm sorry, I, mean, I forgot the name in the back, is, is talking about as a routine. And I've been, Caleb's mom. Look, Caleb's mom. Part of those, I know you're saying too. <laughs> part, part of what happens is regular routines cause stress to decrease. So I bet something about you sitting with him and reading that story is relaxing. And you know, if you guys could all take a second and think about like a routine in your day, um, that could be an opportunity for either you yourself to de-stress or, or for you to connect with your kid. All that is sort of what, what we're talking about today. Um, you know, as, as Ellie has mentioned, you're not gonna totally get rid of stress. It's just a part of life. We can manage it better by paying attention to ourselves, by recognizing that caregivers who have a child with autism are at a higher risk of stress than just about anybody else out there. Um, no. There's you know, just a couple examples. 
And I mean, does anybody have anything that really works well aside from some of the examples up here that they've used to kind of de stress? Yoga. Yoga? Hot yoga is very nice too. What was that? Okay, no, I was waiting for it. Thank you. It is all right. If one glass doesn't work, maybe two will <laughs> That is not a Kennedy recommendation. <laughs> so, I'm a fan of mommy timeouts. Uh -huh. So, I have a parent that took one of all the children, and I, I just take mommy timeouts sometimes. The other thing that I'll do with my five year old is um, when I notice that I'm getting really frustrated, I count to 10. I count to 10 for her, but I count to 10 for myself as well. Because when I'm counting to 10, I can take myself from 10 back to 1. And I can take her from about nine to three, which leaves me a bit more managed, able to manage. <laughs> so just being able to sort of step physically step away, then I think I can hold her hands and we count to ten, and then we start over. And so just being able to recognize my yeah. cues when I'm getting really frustrated yeah. is a sign for me to then take a step back and start looking at the situation and say, "What is happening? Is she hungry? Is she sleepy?" Is she tired? Because those are typically those key triggers that are going to cause some sort of outburst. And while I'm coming to 10 and thinking about what our plan is going to be, I sort of re-enter mentally the situation, and then I'm able to move forward. Uh, and that's just, I can do it at any time. Counting to 10 is free. So I just should say, I know where I am, and then move forward. That's really helpful. And it models, too. It models. It models, it models to your child. And she will count to 10. What? What is the right way? Um, so for the, the parents in the room, you've already done this, and you're already doing it, and you will probably always do it um, for your kid. You're researching things, you're motivating yourself to do those things, and you're trying to activate a plan to do it. Um, internally, you know, we talked about uh, the, the, the process that happens. Um, for the professionals in the room, and this research piece is one thing I always talk to families about is like, I say Google with caution. So a family, when they hear autism, they will Google it usually. I, in all the time I've worked here, I haven't met a family who hasn't, even folks who don't have internet. Or if they think their child has autism, right. they'll start to Google. And you just get a flood of stuff. And some, some of it is, is, is harmful at worst and just misinformation at best. So you really want to touch base with folks um, about what sorts of things they're researching um, and, and have an open conversation about it and uh, I can direct you to uh, some um, organizations and sites that are that look at the research behind different autism interventions because there is not one, not one for one kid. Um, Ian Interactive Autism Network is, is, is affiliated with Kennedy Krieger. There's information in the back. There's certainly one of those organizations that look at the research behind different interventions um, anything from transition planning for kids in high school to social skills groups, uh, uh, special diets. Um, so I encourage you to, 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 to check them out. They have a menu bar on the left. Show you their site. Um, so who can support you in the process? Um, if you don't mind, so, well, I'll tell you first, in, in Maryland there's an organization called Pathfinders for Autism. Um, then there's a national organization that has local chapters. It's called Autism Society of America. Most counties have a chapter. Um, organizations like your local ARC often has respite programs or their family education opportunities. Um, there's other organizations called the Parent, Parent Place of Maryland, um, which is another big organization in Maryland that helps families make informed health care and education decisions. Um, I'd like to take a second. Is it okay? Let's roll. We've got. Okay, we're running out of time, and I know okay. resources. I'd like to take a second and just show you guys how to navigate, because it's easy for me to say, oh, go check out Pathfinders, and uh, they'll tell you what you need to know. Um, and this, the, the resources that we'll go over, too, they're, they're on the list that you guys have. Hopefully you pick them up in the back of the room. Okay, so one thing that I think is quite helpful is you go, this is their home page, you go over Autism by Age, and they have a checklist. So let's just say six, six to twelve, and it's a checklist to see if you're doing the things um, you could be doing uh, with your kid. So it's a list. Have you signed up for the autism waiver? Have you applied for DDA? And they might not ever need those services, but it's worth exploring. Again, get on as many wait lists as you can. Yeah. 
um, investigate behavior supports if you need them. So what do I mean when I say behavior supports? It could be a thousand and one different things. I'll give you an example here. Uh, behavioral psychology, Kennedy Krieger Institute has a behavioral psychology department um, that addresses specific behaviors. Um, uh, scheduled regular reevaluations and medical follow-ups. Um, that could happen with a developmental pediatrician um, or a neuropsychologist or a psychiatrist, depending on what your child's needs are. We have a, I don't know if we have them in the back, but we have a paper that has a list of uh, specialized medical professionals that work with kids on the autism We do spectrum. have that back here. Oh, we do, okay. Um, develop a system to organize your paperwork. Um, I tend to, because I'm disorganized, I tend to skip right over this when I'm talking to parents. Like, yeah, it's just as simple as a, as a binder. But it's super important. I mean, it's super important because your kids amass a ton of paperwork. And the, the easier you can access it, the, the easier it is to make decisions about what you're going to do uh, and, and, and how you're going to talk to folks. Um, if, if the evaluation itself is hard to read and you're not sure, like you just met with a developmental pediatrician and you're not sure what they recommended, talk to them, you know? Or make an appointment with, with, a, with a social worker that's involved in their practice to help you sift through some of that stuff. Because you may leave that appointment thinking like, uh, they don't have food allergies or their GI stuff is okay. But really what the developmental pediatrician recommended at the bottom was maybe an hour of outpatient speech there. You want to make sure you're, you're getting that, that information. And the military is phenomenal with organization. And they have, and it's in one of the handouts that you guys picked up at the back, is just a very, we pulled it from one of their binders, just how to organize a binder on um, you know, everything from the medical to the educational to the therapy. And it's, it's simple stuff, but sometimes we overlook it and we just start jamming stuff into a inner office memo or an inner office envelope or a middle folder or whatever. So it gives you some, just some very basic but good um, points of reference on how to organize. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. I was going to ask you to go back to the birth of five years just because um, we're finding more and more in the last two years, I think, that um, all of our children are Baltimore City children. And we're finding more and more, Baltimore City Schools has an obligation to provide services to these children once identified regardless of what the disability is. Mm -hmm. And more and more they're telling us, especially now, um, oh, he's so young, you know, don't, don't worry. And I believe, I believe all my heart, that early identification, early intervention are key to improve that Absolutely. But it's not a lot that we can do, or that I can do, if the city says, oh, we're not testing. We had them just recently. If I test a child and give them, and I'll just submit this coordinator, Ms. Brown will submit the paperwork, and now the speech and language person will come into the school and just call us and say, oh, I'm not going to test this child. What he's doing is age appropriate, that kind of stuff. And we know that that's not true. We've been working with kids a long time. But what do we do in a situation like that when the, the school system refuses either to come in to look at the children no. or to provide services? We had a child uh, in her site just last week who I suspected is clearly on the autism spectrum. Um, with the mom and dad both had some, some problems themselves. And dad, when I talked to him after testing the child, he was very excited that it was, it was you know, we noticed it. We were trying to get help for her, but then when the school system comes into the meeting, well, we go to the school because they used to come to outside, so now we have to go to the zone schools. But the mom says, oh, um, I see her doing a whole lot better now at home, da 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 and then the teacher, not, not this teacher, but another teacher says, well, you know, I see some progress. I think teachers are afraid to say, you know, any questions. But I'm not concerned about that. We can, we can deal with that working with teachers and coordinators and their supervisors. My problem is with the school system not being willing to provide services to these kids. Or, I know these sorts of try the least restrictive thing first. They'll come in and they'll say, we'll give them 30 minutes of speech, 30 minutes of special education, and 30 minutes of OT or something like that. But then they don't do it. And we just need help with getting them to accept the responsibility for, for providing services. So I think one of the tracks um, in that situation is, is getting that child evaluated and if the school system's not going to do it there's lots of providers Kennedy being one Mount Washington there's other places throughout the Baltimore area um, to get that child in so they can get evaluated 
you've got a speech language eval, a medical eval, so, an occupational eval. Well, we have a service through Maryland Therapy Network if it's speech and language to them, but so you're telling us when you give us information about context to come in and evaluate the children if they need the help, mm -hmm. if the city won't do it? Not come in. I think with, with just, uh, are you talking about external? Yeah, just external. I mean, we're not coming in, but. So we have to bring the, the parent has to step somehow we get Whoa. to you. Correct. Right. And I think the yeah. other alternative here is so oh. there's a lot of parents in the room Mommy. and so there are a lot of advocates oh. in the room. And parents are de absolutely their child's Ooh. number one advocate. So as much as you can continue to inform the parent of what your concerns are and what your observations are and give them the full information about what their options are. Oh. If the school is initially if the system is saying initially no, we are not seeing the same areas of concern, but you've seen them, the parent agrees with what you're saying. Yeah. Then and make sure that parent knows what their additional options are. So it could be external evaluations that they could then present to that school system. It could be speaking with someone else within the school system who may be able to make um, the decision. Those all school systems have an autism specialist. And so maybe connecting directly with that person. If that's if you suspect that the child is on the autism spectrum, absolutely every school system has one. And so, so if you call the Board of Education, they can tell you who their autism specialist is and, and just sort of helping the parent, empowering the parent to become an advocate as well. Yes. Um, also, this seems like a much larger issue you're having with this school system, but for now with external referrals, um, if you do have anyone who is worried about going to an external referral because of insurance and cost, um, we are in the research department, I think I'm the one of our research here, um, we are currently recruiting suspected um, ASD children for certain studies, and those would be free of cost. It's not an official diagnosis, but you will get a report um, that you can then take to the school officials. That would help, so if that's an issue for people, um, that's something we have a community. And that's an excellent point because I think a lot of people when they hear research have different reactions and so the research, uh, the clinicians that we have in our research department here are very highly trained professionals. We have a lot of clinicians that work both in our clinic and in the research realm as well. I brought my own children in for um, assessments to be in the sort of control group and it's an amazing experience. You get lots of comprehensive information about your child's development. Uh, the clinicians are warm and engaging and the REACH is our research entity It's on the first floor of this building and we have any number of studies that are available as, as you mentioned free of charge and it really is it's a great experience I have lots of families and families and friends that I sort of direct here as well because the connotation of research in the larger community and what it actually looks like a structured developmental assessment here in our center is quite different so I really want to make sure that you know, takes, to, to link it back to the presentation I'm sure I can speak to it it takes a ton of energy to do that stuff so again, you know, just tons of extra energy on top of your life that's already happening, making it especially important that you do for yourself, even when you feel like you shouldn't. Um, really quick, uh, you want to this right here? Now? Yeah, I just want to show you guys. So this is on Pathfinders. This is their homepage. You can go over to resources and help, and this is like a bit like an electronic social worker in in, in some ways. Um, they have articles about stuff. Quiet. They also have, and I'm just going to breeze through this, forgive me, um, this feature, which I think is really nice. So, so it allows you to search for supports in your local area. And this itself can be super overwhelming. Uh, you know, just tons of stuff you could do. I think about education. With your, like, your kid. Well, let, let, yeah, well, we can go to education. Let's, one place I like to start is like therapies, right? Let's just say you're looking for a speech therapist. You click on it. We'll type in our zip code. 21211, and it gives you a range of mileage. I usually do 20. You accept their terms of service, and it'll bring you up a list. Of, hopefully, yeah. Bring you up a list, right? Speech providers with their number. And then after this, you do the insurance dance, figure out if they take your insurance or not. But um, <coughs> you can do that with educational advocates. There's there's a box on there. You click on education and you can go the lawyer route, again, very expensive. Even educational advocates can, can be costly. It is, it's $160 an hour. Wow. But worth it, right? Why? You know, it's worth it going to that oh, it's, it's well worth it. And, and so you can, you'll can you be able to click on there under education and you can click lawyer or advocate. And then you just punch in the zip code of where, wherever you live. Just to give you some stuff. Um, they also have ways to get involved with them, and this is how these organizations improve when people get involved um, and how they grow. Um, um, they have a calendar. So 
I'd encourage you to play around on their website. The other big one, if you don't know about it already, is Autism Speaks. This is the big national organization. You may be familiar with their walks. And um, I met a family the other day who raised money for the walk, went on a walk, and had never accessed any information on their website. And there's a lot of it. Um, and it comes in the form of toolkits. Um, you can go over to Family Services, click on it. And on the left, you'll see a menu of stuff. They have their own resource guide that allows you to search for resources by state. They also have these toolkits. 100 Day Toolkit is the, is the popular one. If your kid had to get a blood draw, how to prepare for it, they have social stories in there. Um, toilet toilet training. Sleep. Family toolkits. I like this one. Have that for you. In some ways, I use it more than a 100 day toolkit. And if you have to talk to a sibling about autism, or a grandparent, or a friend, it's about 30 pages, and it gives you language to use with people in your life um, when, when, when you know, you're struggling to find words. So that'll give you a picture. Also, for older kids, they have residential stuff if they might need it, um, school and community toolkit. There's an explanation there. Haircuts, transition for kids that are at in high school. Um, they also have an uh, IEP toolkit, but it's not up right now. You can it. IEP. Oh, yeah. And I know I'm breezing through it. a sense of what a toolkit looks like. So this is Autism Speaks IEP Toolkit. How to request an evaluation. We have a lot, we've got a lot of information on our Kennedy site. Again, it's going to be in the list of resources. But if you go into the Kennedy Springer website, kennedyspringer.org, and you just, you type in HEAL, H-E-A-L, we've got a, um, a program run by two lawyers who provide a lot of information and assistance and guidance as it relates to the IEP process. Now they have called um, criteria in terms of uh, a financial criteria on how much, or a um, income criteria on how much a family can make before they can actually you know, be present in an IEP or be that advocate. But they often do a lot just over the phone without any kind of criteria at all. I mean, you can call them up. Um, and ask them questions or just guidance, and they'll do that over the phone. They're very busy. Uh, the other thing I just want to put, this is the local Autism Society of America chapter. You know, autism is confusing. Um, sometimes support groups might not be a fit. Your kids might have different needs than another person, and it might, might, might not feel like a fit for you for a variety of reasons. I would still encourage you to check out at least the website of your local support network. They have a calendar of events, which include not just, you know, support groups for like family activities. Um, they also have generally like resources. I know no. the Baltimore chapter comes in the form of a newsletter. Um, and also they're very inexpensive. It's ten dollars a month to do no. uh, and like last Saturday the Power County they had the all season no. sensory friendly movie at the Columbia Mall. It was six dollars but we did the lights and the sounds. And even if the kids act up or whatnot, it's okay because you feel like you're amongst family. You don't stand no. up. And yet, the Baltimore chapter, I know this Sunday we're going to an event at, um, it's a Build a Bear workshop. And it's free. Yeah, it's free for members. Mm -hmm. And normally it costs like $25 just to make the bear, but you pay $10 being a member. And, and it's one of those events that are free. We did pictures yeah. with Santa, and it was just, we haven't had a picture with Santa ever because it was just so mm -hmm. catastrophic. And we high five Santa, and we sat with Santa, and mommy got her family picture. It was just, it was beautiful. It was amazing. And we made lots of new friends. Also, but they're, they're doing teleconferencing you now because it's hard to get out on Thursday night at 7 o'clock, so you can dial in now and be part of the group. So it's connecting. And again, it's and you, already I've learned new stuff just sitting here with you, standing here with you guys. Um, and it's if you're not already connected or if you have a family um, that's not connected, finding that local chapter, finding that local support group, make one. and getting them or making one getting connected. You learn more from people who are on that journey. Maybe they're a couple years ahead of you on that journey, um, but they can, they can help in so many ways.
So ultimately, you know, the goal, hopefully, um, is to enjoy your kid. And I think de-stressing helps do that. Um, there's ways to do that. Um, you know, you guys, I, I heard it a few times in the form of stories, but you recognize that your kids all have strengths. It's important to keep those in mind, too. Um, so often on this, kind of on this journey, you hear the word delay in front of your child in so many different ways. The speech delay, the social, delay, 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 ugh, frustrating. You can't forget, and you've got to really, as, as a caregiver yourself, your child brings you strength, joys. They bring so much to this relationship that the professionals don't necessarily see. Um, so don't lose sight of the strengths that your child has. And as professionals, don't lose sight of the strengths that each child has. And you get so focused on those delays that you lose sight of the strengths. Tour? Over. Does anybody have any questions? Or? And if you don't, you can write them down. I think um, Stacy has the, um, the survey forms. Or they already have them.